right, good morning, everybody. So great to see you. Thank you for coming out. Welcome everybody online at our campuses. Love you. Thank you so much for being here. And if you're a guest with us, uh, special welcome to you. We give what we call every weekend the three hugs of grace to our guests. And the first one is that you are a gift to us. So you could be anywhere right now doing anything, but you chose to be with us. That means the world to us. Thank you so much. Second hug is that you're okay not to be okay. Whatever that looks like for you, we're all walking through something. But our hope is you don't want to stay in that not okay place. And then thirdly is that we love you enough to tell you the truth, the capital T truth of Jesus Christ, his person, his work, his words, and also the capital T truth of the scriptures that we bring to you. Such a joy to have you in a series that's winding down. We'll conclude it next weekend, but have a hopeful word for us today. So let me pray and we'll get after it. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We need you. Everyone watching right now at our campuses or online and in this room, we're all here with something. And so I pray that your Holy Spirit will speak so deeply to every heart in the personal way they hope you will speak to them. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are built for certainty. That's why if you have an iPhone, you have an AccuWeather app, don't you? And even if you don't, I'm sure you go online to check out what the weather is because we want certainty in our lives. We want to know what the weather is tomorrow. If we're making plans, we want to know what the weather is for the weekend. We are a people wired for certainty. And being that we're wired for certainty, it makes it very difficult when we look ahead and there is great uncertainty in terms of world events, in terms of our own personal lives uncertainty. What uncertainty, I mean, think about the uncertainty we're in right now. I mean, world events, then there's still whispers of the pandemic. There is, maybe you're here today with uncertainty regarding your finances, uncertainty regarding your future, uncertainty regarding relationships, or even your health. And then we get worried about it or anxious about it. And and what happens is we feel like the more worried we are, the more anxious we are, the more we agonize over something, we can gain some sense of control over it. And it does not happen, does it? And we find ourselves even more anxious and in a state of despair and fear. So the question is, in light of the great uncertainty that can happen in our lives and our futures and in the world, where can we find certainty? Where do we turn? How do we cope? And that's where we turn to the scriptures for that help and that hope. We're in a psalm this weekend. So we've been in the psalms for five or six weeks now. And we've been with psalms with King David that he's written. Well, we're going to let King David rest in peace now, okay? And we're going to deal with a different psalm today and a different psalm next weekend to tie up our time together. So this is Psalm 121. And in this psalm, it's, uh, it's called a song of ascent. So there are many psalms that that are titled that a song of ascent and this happens to be one of them and it's simply how the the worshipers God's people would travel uphill toward the top of the hill toward the mountain in which to worship the Lord in Jerusalem and on that journey they would sing or they would pray and these would be the prayers they would pray and the songs they would sing in light of the uncertainty on their uphill journey so let's turn to Psalm 121 and We'll read it together. I'll make some comments and then we'll dig into what it means for us today. Psalm 121, verse 1. I lift up my eyes to the mountains, to the hills, and from where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. Now pause. We cannot go past a phrase like, he who keeps Israel, without making a comment, all right? So let me just say, I think it goes without saying, how we stand and support Israel. All eyes on Israel, from Genesis to Revelation, to this time, to the end of time, and to time without end. God's work is in his people. Is Israel imperfect in the leadership there? Absolutely. Absolutely. But still, God has a special love for his people. Psalm chapter 122, one chapter over, says that we are to seek the peace of Jerusalem for our own sake and for the sake of our family and friends. That's huge. 
But do we pray for the innocent suffered on all sides? We absolutely do. But let us keep our eyes on prophecy unfolding, the end times approaching, all eyes on Israel. We're going to do a series out of Revelation in January, and that was my commercial for it. All right? So let's keep going. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. So we find some beautiful truths here, how you and I can have certainty in our uncertainty. And first of all, you can be certain of this, that the Lord helps you. If you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ and you are a born-again follower of him, you are a child of God and an orphan no more. Your father helps you. That you can be certain of. And if you're here today and you are not born again, if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, if you have not been made a child of God, I would urge you, this is your day. This is your moment. In light of world events and how things are moving, and especially that God's ordained you to be here today or to watch today, this is your moment so that you can be certain that the Lord helps you. Psalm 121, 1 and 2, he says, I lift my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? So it's as if he's kind of looking around here, wondering where this help is going to come from. So there's a sense of anxiety, of insecurity, that's happening here with, with this psalmist. Because going uphill is indeed uphill. It reminds me a lot about life. How about you? Anybody walk in here today because of the grind of life uphill has made you exhausted? How the uncertainty on the uphill journey has worn you out? How there's anxiety? They would have anxieties on the journey. There could be bandits and robbers and wild animals. Then what's at the top of the hill waiting on me? Is there heartache or happiness? Is there blessing or peril? Anybody walk in here with that today? That's the same uncertainty they were facing and this is how they're lifting their eyes. They feel small against the hills. Like we can feel small when it comes again to world events and everything that can be happening even in our personal lives. He says, from where does my help come? So he's going from looking around to looking within himself. Where does my help from, come from? So is he looking at himself and going, self, will you help me? Because there are bestsellers around Amazon and bookstores all about self-helping you. And maybe there's some truth within it somewhere, but it's not going to give you the help and the certainty you desire. Or maybe there's other means that will help me. So on the hills, often false religions would build their idols up there. So making it a little simplistic, but it would be something like this. If I'm scared about my finances, I want to go worship the financial God. If I'm worried about my health, I want to go worship the, health, the God of health. So he's saying, is there a God up there somewhere that might can help me out of my health situation or out of my financial situation or out of my relational situation? Will that be where my help comes from? Or maybe, and this is what we don't see, and I'm grateful, because often we might do what he's not doing, and that's to cover our eyes and just not want to know. We, we just don't want to know the uncertainty. We want to ignore the uncertainty. We want to, we want to control the uncertainty by checking out from it, closing our eyes or, or numbing ourselves to it or uh, escaping from it. That's why we often sit down and the uncertainty starts coming over us and we end up watching an entire season of The Office. Or you'll have your third glass of wine or you'll go on to social media for ten, thinking you're going to be there for 10 minutes and you spend two hours or you go to the Oreo box and you're just going to have two cookies and you instead you had two rows of cookies <laughs> because you're overwhelmed by the uncertainty of it all. And so we look to other means. And so what he's doing here in his anxiety and insecurity about the uncertainty, he's looking around, he's looked within, but now he looks up. Psalm 121, 1 and 2, my help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. The word, the phrase the Lord is repeated five different times in eight verses. The Lord literally is Yahweh. It's a translation of Yahweh, which is the covenant-keeping God, the God who delivered his people across the Red Sea from certain doom. He's the God who becomes ultimately Yeshua, who dies on the cross for our sin and is risen again. 
This is the personal love of God who made heaven and earth. That's such good news because I wonder how many of you walked in here today or you're watching right now at one of our campuses. You walked in here today, you're watching today with the weight of heaven and earth on your shoulders. You walked in here with the weight of the world on you. Well, good news, you don't have to carry that weight. You're unable to. Let him carry the weight for he's made it. He's made heaven and earth. And this is a sense that gives gives this psalmist great hope that he's not in, that the psalmist is not in control. You're not in control. I'm not in control. There is one who is in control. So we don't have to be. He made heaven and earth. And and the, the New Testament goes on to say that He even holds heaven and earth together right now in this moment. Every atom, every breath you take, he holds it together. It's the way the psalmist put it. Christ is the invisible, sorry, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through Christ, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. Everything was created through Christ and for Christ. Christ existed before anything else, and Christ holds all creation together. Those hands nailed to the cross, those hands that carried the scars of the cross, even in this moment, holds all things together, y'all. I had an Old Testament professor back in the day who read this psalm, and he said to us, he said, listen, don't get worried and anxious about whatever is happening in the world whatever's happening in society, just look up when you start to get anxious and notice that the stars are in place and the sun is where it's supposed to be and you can know God's got it. He says, but when you really need to start worrying is if you look up and the stars start start wobbling away. Now you know God has let things go. That's when you worry. But what the psalmist here is saying that the Lord would rather let go of heaven and earth before he let go of you. You're his child. Do you know that the Lord will help you? Will you look to the Lord to help you? He helps you, or helps you in your uncertainty. Secondly, be certain of this, that the Lord watches over you. Now, that can sound creepy for some of us. I think I shared this uh, a while back, but I was headed toward a shop right in a different part of Orange County, for the sole purpose of sushi. I do like ShopRite sushi, all right? So I go into the ShopRite, I'm looking for it, and it's not cheap. I hadn't had it in a long time due to inflation, but I'm in my way in there. I get a text from my wife, Christy. She said, Jared, I see you. You're a ShopRite in the fish section. Just a reminder, we're on the budget, all right? And some of us can have that idea of God that he's like watching everything, or we can have an idea of God that he's, he's watching us in terms of surveillance. He's surveilling us, just waiting for us to mess up so he can punish us. Where that is not at all what we find with scripture. We find he is a, he is a father who lovingly watches over us with great care, with great love, personal care and love. He watches over you. Psalm 121.3, Yahweh, who will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he, Yahweh, who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. He will not let your foot be moved. This is important. Just go hiking and you know how important this is. That's why we have the special shoes or the special boots. We don't want our foot to be moved. The worst thing that can happen is you slip and you fall or you turn your ankle. Things will go bad. So with that idea that psalmist is saying, God's got me. He's not going to let my foot be moved. Will I slip? Yes. Will I stagger? Absolutely. But God says, when you do, reach out and I got you. You can reach out for me. I will not fail you. That's why he keeps us steady. What he means is he keeps us steady in different temptations that might overwhelm you and me, especially when we're closing our eyes to the uncertainty. We want to check out. We can know that God will be the one you can grab hold of, not the cookies or the social media for two hours. Also, he's with you and keeps you steady and secure and stable before his eyes and in his love through tough situations and even dealing with difficult people. Psalm 37, 23, here's how we can have confidence that he does so, that the Lord makes firm the steps of the one who delights in him. This has been a theme in our series 
If I just take it and put it over to Psalm 73 where it says that the Lord, that the Lord is our all and that he's to be the one who meets all our needs. He satisfies us. So therefore we would say, whom have I in heaven but you? And there is none on earth I desire but you. What a call that will make your anxiety and mine dissipate. That he is the delight. And there we have his We have confidence of him doing this in our lives so we keep our eyes and our desire in him. It says he keeps us twice. He's our maker. You're made for him. You're built for him. There is no happiness or peace outside of him. It does not exist. It might exist for a weekend. It might exist for a season. But in the end, you will find yourself back to this emptiness. So he keeps you. He he. You heard of finders, keepers, losers, weepers in a sense. That's a way of us saying something's very valuable. Or a promise keeper, someone who keeps their promise to even to the place that it hurts. So is he. He's the one who holds you as valuable. You're his child. He keeps his promise even when it hurts because it hurt him all the way to the cross to keep his promise to you, that he watches over you and is with you. Now think of things you keep. If your house is on fire, I know right immediately if our house, God forbid, ever caught on fire, I know the very things I would grab on the way out, things that mean the most to me. In the same way, it's as if God says, if heaven and earth went up in flames, you're the first one I'd grab. And indeed, he does that in his coming, his coming to come. It says that we will not slumber nor sleep. This is such good news that he does not slumber, he does not sleep, he does not doze off like some of you do while I'm preaching, but I still love you. Go ahead and doze. I know you're tired. You can listen to it later, all right? Actually, I can't see any of y'all. These lights are too bright. But he doesn't sleep. He doesn't doze. And that's good news for me. I need about three cups of coffee before anything. Don't talk to me until after my third cup of coffee, all right? So God, though, he doesn't need anything. He doesn't need the coffee. He doesn't doze off. He doesn't slumber. He doesn't sleep. And it seems like if God makes everything and sustains everything, if anybody deserves a nap, it would be him. But it just highlights him being all powerful in every way that we can imagine. This is good news as we've learned over the series because everything seems worse at night. And so when we go through that, this is good news that God continues to watch. When we lay there and we go, what if that happens? How will I get through this? What is this going to look like? Well, God watches in love. And if you think about sleep, think about sleep, when you went to sleep last night and when you go to sleep tonight, if you were able to sleep much, when you went to sleep, you are never so vulnerable than when you go to sleep. You can't defend yourself. You can't, you are in complete surrender. And God says, especially at your most vulnerable and weak place, he's watching over you. He's guiding you. He's with you. That's the promise. He does not slumber or sleep. As one writer said, As long as God's going to be up all night, both of us don't have to (laughs) because he's the one going to be up, so we ought to go to sleep because he watches over you, watches over me. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? And he's for you. He's all powerful for you. So be certain that the Lord helps you. Be certain that the Lord watches over you. Then be certain that the Lord is with you. Be certain that the Lord is with you. Psalm 121, 5 and 6, the Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. So that shade there had to do with the people traveling. There was great anxiety over the oppressive heat and also spiritual threats. And they would know the, the, the refreshing would be that I abide in the shadow of God. A shadow, I'm sorry, a shade engulfs you where you sit and where you walk, where you work. You work in the shade. You walk in the shade under God's protective care. Also, it talks about the right hand here. Scriptures talk more about God's right hand, and the right hand of God had more to do with, it's it's phrasing that had to do with how powerful he is, how all-powerful he is, how, how mighty he is. It also had to do with his strength as well. But it talks about here, our right hand, And at our right hand, we are most vulnerable. We are weak. We are powerless. So he is our power in our weakness. He's our strength in our weakness where we are most vulnerable. In those moments where we feel alone, he is close to us in such a way. He gives us strength. The right hand also had to do with skill, which means wisdom. So where we face uncertainty, how are we going to get through it all? How are we going to take care of it all? What are we going to do if this uncertainty 
becomes a certainty of chaos and, and what I hoped would not happen. Well, right then, God is with you to give you wisdom to navigate through it in your life. He talks about the sun and the moonlight striking. But before we think of it striking, just think of the sunlight and the moonlight. When you walk out into the sun, there's nothing closer to you in that moment than the sun on your skin. If you walk out in the full moon, there's nothing closer to you than the moonlight on your skin. So in the same way, he's saying that God is so close to us, closer than the light of the sun and the moon. It's, it's like my hand here. I can see my hand clearly, but if I put my hand up to my eyes like this, it's too close. It's so close that I can't see it. So in the same way, when God feels so distant, could it be that he's so close you can't see him? He's closer than ever. It says that the sun will not strike you by day. We kind of get that heat stroke in some sense. But what about the moon striking by night? Is that even a thing? Well, there is a thing called being moonstruck. And back in their day, there was perceived dangers in the moonlight or at night where bandits and robbers and, again, animals could come out to attack them. But the moon also represented spiritual dangers. We still have those kind of perceptions today of what might be lurking in the night. That's why many of you still won't sleep at night with your leg dangling off the bed, will you? Because there's something in you. Maybe it's just me. I don't know. But may, there, there's something in you that thinks something's lurking under the bed in the night right? That, that we can't help it. And what they're saying is the psalmist is saying, no, God's cleared out everybody from under the bed that will harm you. He's got you. He's watching over you. Also, the word Luna is, has to do with the moon, such as lunacy or lunatic. So anxiety and worry over the uncertainty can bring lunacy to our lives, just despair and, and chronic despair and anxiety and worry as well. Yahweh is the one who personally keeps you from the heat of your circumstances to the unknown in the night, what bumps under the bed to the uncertainty of tomorrow. He keeps you. He sees you. He's with you. What I've heard from people throughout this series is this. I feel so seen. That's what many have said. I feel so seen. I love that because you are seen by a God who loves you. Because you're carrying something, a brokenness, a fear, a trauma, a, a darkness, something within you, and you don't know what to do with it, and you don't think anyone understands, but God does, and he's shown it to you by seeing you in love. He will never look away from you. He is for you to the end and for all time and for time without end. Amen? Amen. All right. So that's how you can be certain. You can be certain that the Lord helps you. You can be certain that the Lord watches over you. You can be certain that the Lord is with you. And then you can be certain that the Lord takes care of you. The Lord takes care of you. Psalm 121, 7 and 8. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. So you're going out and you're coming in. That's, as we learned, someone once said, life is just so daily. Going out and coming in. Get up, brush your teeth, take a shower, get in the car, get on the train, commute, get the kids up, get them ready for school, and you do your thing, you come home, you, you eat, or you, you sit down and watch the game, and it's just the grind, the uphill grind. It just seems bad sometimes. Sometimes it's beautiful, but most of the times it's boring. We're somewhere in the middle of coming and going. And the psalmist is saying, in it all, God knows what you're walking through. He knows what's happening within you. He, he knows what you're feeling and what you're carrying. And he is there to take care of you. He says that the Lord will keep you from all evil and he will keep your life. What? Okay, so let's talk about that for a minute. Because I wonder how many of you would go, hmm, Pastor, the Lord will keep me from all evil. The Lord, will, the Lord will keep my life. I wonder how many of you hear that and you go, mm, I don't know. Because you've been through some evil, haven't you? Or you have loved ones who have. Or look at world events and the innocence. Where do we, what are we to do with this? Because those who were on the uphill journey to worship, they experienced harm too. They got attacked. Things happened to them. So what, what is going on here? Listen, the Bible, never, the Bible does not say that things won't go bad. The Bible exists because they do. Starting with Genesis, when the fruit was eaten and sin fractured the world, 
Thus, sin means world wars and hurricanes and tornadoes and earthquakes and mental illness and cancer. That's not God's fault. That's sin's fault. So it can't mean that we're just going to have a pain-free, evil-free in terms of what we experience life. This can't be what it means. That's why you look at the, you zoom in on the psalm and then you zoom out to look at the whole of scripture and what does he mean? Here's what he means, that the Lord will keep you from all ultimate evil and that he will keep your life eternally. That's why scripture's like this. Colossians chapter three says that you and I are hidden in Christ. That means nothing can come to you unless it goes through Christ first and things can come that are harmful. That's why Genesis chapter 50, I love how it's in the first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 50, where this man by the name of Joseph, his brothers turned on him and wanted him dead, wanted to destroy him. He really went through hell until he came to a place where God blessed him and then he was reunited with his brothers. He could have taken it out on his brothers for what they did to him, but he said to them instead, what you meant for evil, God meant for good, for the saving of many lives. Then we get to Romans 8, some of our, one of our favorite coffee cup verses, and rightly so, where it says that God, all things God works together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose, conforming us to the image of his son. So that, that implies harm happens. Evil can happen in our lives. But what it means is this, that you might see the good of it in life, or if not, it will be understood in light of eternity. That's the ultimate promise, the ultimate promise. Keep in mind, and I probably overuse this, but it helps me all the time, that our understanding of what we experience and we see in world events and suffering, we're only teacups in our understanding. God is the oceans of eternal understanding and wisdom and ways, and our little teacup cannot comprehend the oceans, but we know and hold on to the fact that he's good. And we know it because he gave his only son to die on the cross in our place for our sin and then rose up on the third day. I think it was Dr. Tim Keller who said to think about it this way. Think of when Jesus was dying on the cross. Do you think anybody watching him suffer on the cross, crying out, being forsaken, do you think anybody looked at that and went, I see the good in this? No, there was no good in that. No one saw the good in that. It just looked like a man facing un untold suffering. But then three days later, a lie from the grave. So you can't just look at suffering and think there's no good in it. No, it's coming. Now, is it coming this life? Hopefully, but ultimately it will be understood in eternity. That's why you got to look past 85 years to 85,000 years. Because we have this vapor we have right now, and then there's eternity with God in which we are to understand everything that makes this even so much more beautiful is that the Lord takes care of you because he will not allow anyone or anything to separate you from his love. And listen, when I'm saying these things, preaching these things about God's going to take it for good, there's some of you who have been through real, real pain, even evil. And you hear this, and I, I, if I'm sitting where you are, I too would think, really? And I, I would even maybe get angry to hear something like that and just know I understand. But I hope you hear it and will keep your heart and mind open to it and, and move toward the Lord to bring more and more sense out of it or to grow your faith with it. And then ultimately to take on and believe, pound it into your soul that nothing can separate you from his love. What do we do with that? How do you bring that home to understand real practically? Well, God will keep you from anything that would ultimately harm or destroy your soul. So with Jesus, Jesus said in Luke chapter 16, verse 18, he says, though everyone turn against one, other, one another, he looks at his people and says, but not one hair of your head will perish Y'all, I got hair perishing right now. Look at my bald spot. I got, I got hair perishing everywhere right now. And growing in places, it's like, what's hair doing there? Okay, too much information. I'm sorry, all right? 
But what does he mean by hair, you know, hair of the head perishing? He's saying that, you know, there are things you're going to go through now, betrayal and pain, but ultimately for eternity, nothing's going to be harmed with you. Then you have Jesus saying stuff like this in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. Don't fear those who kill the body, but those who can kill the soul, which means the greatest evil you could ever experience in your existence is for you to be separated from God. That's the greatest evil. That's the evil God, child of God, holds you from. That's why 85,000 years into eternity matters and gives us a perspective in our 85 years or so here. So the greatest evil the, the, can be separated from God forever. Therefore, the promise here of keeping you from ultimate evil is this, that God will keep you from anything or anyone that would kill your soul. Also, that God will not allow anything to happen in your life to cause you to lose your faith or eternal life. And for anyone who goes through anything and does cause them to lose their faith, where their faith was in something else than Christ. But that's the promise of the Lord. That's why Paul sums it up in the New Testament this way, Romans 8. And I am convinced, I am certain that nothing can separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. That's the ultimate promise of keeping you. God will see to it. I love how it says neither death nor life. Death, even in death. What a horror death is to so many people when it's understood in a whole different way in Scripture. If God's going to keep you in this life, you can bank on it. He's going to keep you through what may seem horrible to you, death. You know, this matters. De death matters. You know, when I was 15, this didn't really matter. I'm 51. This matters now. You know, I'm getting my heart checked and the colon checked and the brain checked, and you're trying to keep ahead of things because death's coming 100%. 10 out of 10, it's coming for everybody. And that's why you gotta go and see how he keeps us. That's why there are language in scripture like this. Death has lost its sting in Christ. That's why, as I said last week or the week before, 2 Corinthians 5, Paul says, death for the believer is nothing but I'll see you soon, folding up your tent and walking home. That's all it is. Nothing to be fearful of. He's with you. He keeps you, born again believer, in death. That's why one, a philosopher once said this, that in light of heaven, the worst suffering here will then seem like just a rough night in a bad hotel. <laughs> and then we can see how the psalmist lands it of how we're to go about our lives in Psalm 73, where here he says, yet I am always with you, Yahweh. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and when your counseling session with me is over, afterward you will take me into glory. That's the promise. That you can be certain of. So certainty and uncertainty, where are we? The Lord helps you. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is with you, and the Lord takes care of you. And how you can really drive this into your bones is this, is there's one, another one, who walked an uphill journey up the hill called Calvary, where on that hill he died on the cross. His foot nailed to the cross. His cry for help, no answer in return. And he died there for your sin and my sin so that nothing would separate you from the love of God. And his resurrection proves it to be true that you're, you're his child forever. He will never leave you or forsake you. And he's with you to the end of time and to time without end. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's pray together. Oh, Lord, help our unbelief, I pray. Help our belief in the certainty of what you teach us and show us through your scriptures and by your Holy Spirit. Lord, my heart truly is heavy for anyone listening or watching or in this room, and they are not your child, meaning they are not born again. 
They are lost from you. They are separated from you now and forevermore. And as we are in the, these last days of uncertainty unfolding all around us, yet it being completely under your control as things march along to your ultimate plan, I pray those who are far from you, who are not believing in you, that this is their day to place their faith in you, to become your child, that can receive these promises of certainty and of your love kept forever. And for the rest of us, your people, your children, I pray today has been a day of encouragement, Lord. I pray many have felt seen by you today, by your love and by your grace. I pray they would know more and more how you're with them. You help them. You watch over them. That you are everything their hearts desire. That you are the answer they want over everything else. Lord, we praise you that in our own ascent, in an uphill journey of life, in the dangers and the, that await or the blessings or the heartache that is there, we would find you our sure Savior, our strength. Jesus, we know it is all found in you, and we praise you for the hill called Calvary in which you died for us, which, you were, which there was an empty grave when you rose again to assure us of your presence for your glory and our good and also others' joy. We praise you. We praise you that you are our certainty in uncertainty. And I pray this in Jesus' name. We all said, amen. amen. Right.